So we have Jeremy Bertarioni over here, player one, and Robert Gress is player two, both here with 28 points going here into round five. And it looks like Jeremy is on the play. Yes, Jeremy's on the play and also playing Ruby Amethyst. Something to note about the 28 points, by the way, that should mean that both of these players are undefeated so far in the rounds. Yes. Having gone four rounds, going 2-0. and oh, So both players certainly knowing what they're doing, having a good run. I'm very eager to see how this game plays out. And we see Robert inking an Ursula Deceiver to play a Diablo. He'll get a good look at Jeremy's hand. I saw a couple of brawls in there. Uh -huh. The bounce package. Some of the bounce package. Looking for uh, what he needs to play, or what Robert needs to play around in these next couple of turns. And also just with what Jeremy's working with currently. Yeah, so this, I feel like this matchup is pretty close between Ruby Amethyst and Emerald Steel. And really, it's, like, what happens in the first few turns? Yeah, I think you nailed it on the head with that one, Rebecca. A lot of times it comes down to who just gets a really good opening. If Robert misses a Bucky, for instance, and misses some of the discard, then Ruby Amethyst doesn't have to worry too much about missing some of their draw characters. Like, unfortunately, Jeremy hasn't been able to play a one-drop or a two-drop in the past two turns. But, of course, we do see Robert coming out with a very strong turn two, being able to shift this Diablo by discarding an action card and playing the Hidden Cove to move the Diablo there. So now those brawls that were in Jeremy's hand that we saw before no longer can banish the Diablo since the Diablo has three strength and three willpower. Yes, and of course, that is the enchanted Diablo that we see, which is just fantastic. We talked last game, um, last match, about those enchanted cards, how uh, incredible they are, and really fun always to see players bringing those enchanted cards down. And it looks like there's more than one. I think I saw another enchanted card in Robert's ah, I think hand you're right. Holding, Look at that, so. another enchanted Diablo, just waiting in, in the wings. In the wings. Grab your sunglasses, folks. Yes. This is going to be a uh, <laughs> blinding match. Very shiny. We do see a Bucky being played after that. Uh, I don't think there's any Floodborns coming in afterwards, but this will start the discard engine that Bucky provides. We have a fun little play by Jeremy here with the Sisu being played because Sisu gains an extra strength for every card in your opponent's hand. And so Diablo is drawing a card every time Jeremy draws a card, but every time Robert draws a card, the Sisu, Sisu gets, gets bigger. Gets strength. Yes, it's very, very circular. That's very interesting. And Sisu, of course, is the dragon from Riot and the Last Dragon. And one of the things I was thinking about is, you know, this Sisu and even the other um, legendary Sisu that we'll sometimes see um, mm -hmm. uh, that are so powerful, right? And Sisu is so powerful, but the dragon, the character, is the only one of all the dragons that didn't actually have her own powers at all. <laughs> her, her sibling, her dragon siblings had all the powers, but then she got them throughout the throughout the film, but now we have in Lurkana this, these very, very powerful Sisu cards. Yeah, I mean, Sisu might be the most played dragon in Disney Lurkana so, so far. We have yes. the Maleficent, the Maleficent dragon that I can think of, yeah. but there's so many Sisus and so many of them see play, you know? Yeah. We unfortunately didn't see the Flynn come down on Jeremy's side, and I know that that combo, the Flynn Sisu, is one of the really strong openings that a Ruby Amethyst player wants to see. Um, but Especially on the play. Jeremy being able to go first, being able to play the Flynn Rider and then the Sisu and then the Queen's Castle after that, or a rabbit wow. would have been super strong. Oh, we see another enchanted okay. Robin Hood. There's an enchanted Ursula in the Inkwell. And then oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Robert is all blinged out with his deck over here. I, I love it. And that um, Robin Hood coming down, that's going to be, um, yeah, really strong for him. Yeah, especially this early in the game, Robin Hood having three strength and six willpower. It has the ability to banish characters in a challenge, and then when it banishes them in the challenge, you gain two lore. So I've especially loved Robin Hood since it's been revealed. Typically, character cards in Disney Lorcana can only do one of a couple things. They can either challenge for turn or sing or quest. And of course, questing, gaining you lore to help you win the game. So Robin Hood able to do both of those in challenging while progressing your, the win condition is especially good. And then when he's banished in a challenge, then he gets to draw a card. So until we get up to about six ink, where we're looking at some Adam Medusas, this Robin Hood is going to sit there and dare Jeremy to exert any of his cards uh, so that Robin Hood can challenge into them. Yes. And we saw the Peter Pan uh, Shadow Finder come down. Yeah, I love this card in Ruby Amethyst specifically for the Emerald Steel matchup. 
Peter Pan Shadow Finder is an uninkable three cost two three with evasive and rush. And so uh, Jeremy's able to play the Peter Pan Shadow Finder this turn and immediately rush into that exerted Diablo, banishing the Diablo, not having to rely on something like a brawl to banish it. You're also developing a character. Your character is evasive, so you can potentially quest and not see repercussions from that. And then, of course, if Robert plays another Diablo, which we see him do here, you still have a character that can challenge that Diablo again if that Diablo ever exerts itself. Yes, which, of course, Robert wants to have Diablo exerted because that's how you get the card draw. Right, that's the primary way that Emerald Steel draws cards, to be honest with you, and especially playing against Ruby Amethyst player where they really want to be drawing cards for the first couple of turns of the game. We haven't really seen that. I think Rabbit's basically the only thing that we've seen played to draw extra cards. Fortunately, the Bucky, it's been doing a little bit of work. There's been, for the past couple turns, Floodborne's been played, getting rid of cards from Jeremy's hand. But luckily, Jeremy's been able to find at least two rabbits, drawing a couple cards off of that. We're going to see this rabbit being bounced by the Madame M. Fox, which has Rush, and will be able to rush into a uh, that Robin Hood if Jeremy wants to. And I do see that Jeremy has a beat prepared in his hand, which he's actually had for the last couple turns, and it's just kind of sitting there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's kind of a scary thing for Jeremy to even have this beat prepared in, in your hand. It's definitely a card that you want to see as you get closer to 7-8, but knowing that you're playing against Emerald Steel, Robert likely knows that beat prepared is one of Jeremy's best outs to mm -hmm. Diablo and to Bucky. So if Robert has the ability to play an Ursula Deceiver, on, when Jeremy has six ink, knowing he's going to go to seven ink the next turn, then Robert can potentially force Jeremy to discard that be prepared and mess up his entire game plan, leaving Bucky on board and the Diablos to continue to force Jeremy to discard cards and then drawing cards when Jeremy's drawing cards as well. Yeah, so a card like that, the Ursula Deceiver, where you can force your opponent to discard a card, uh, you don't necessarily always want to play it, on curve like sometimes you do want to hold it back and play it at the right time yeah sometimes it's best to not play your ursula deceiver on turn two it's not a terribly statted character and that it has a lot of willpower so it won't always be banished immediately but it's a great way to completely disrupt your opponent's game plan especially when you know that one of their outs to your deck is a song card like be prepared we know that jeremy is Jeremy's game plan for this matchup is essentially to get to 7 ink as fast as you can yeah. so that you can play those Be Prepareds. So if you're able to dis force discard one of those Be Prepareds, you already see another one that had been discarded earlier uh, that's in Jeremy's discard right now. Jeremy can only play four of them. So if two go into the discard, that means that Jeremy's only got two left in the deck. He's less likely to find the others. Robert can play a bit more aggressively with his characters, go a little bit wider and try to end the game before Jeremy can come back. Yeah. And we did see uh, a few different things that happened there. <laughs> so uh, Jeremy had to ink a goat. Unfortunately, that was the only inkable card that he had in his hand. Um, but he played the Madame Medusa to banish Beast, which, uh, you know, Beast is such a strong card, but Medusa just takes care of it in a snap. Yes. Uh, the face that you see on Beast Tragic Hero is how I feel <laughs> when, <laughs> when Madame Medusa gets played on my Beast Tragic Hero. It's tragic. Because Beast is a very powerful card. Oh, and there's I mean, another there's one. There's another one. He just comes right back. <laughs> Can't siege the castle that fast. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> um, so Beast Tragic Hero will draw you a card at the beginning of your turn if he's not damaged. If he is damaged, then he gets an extra four strength until this yeah just for your turn yeah and that was really unfortunate for jeremy because that second beast that just came down because it's a floodborne and he still has that bucky out forced jeremy to discard the last card the in last his hand card, which, which was his be prepared yeah which was that be prepared so that means there's two be prepareds down from jeremy's deck and he's not even up at seven ink either so he needs he's top decking right now has to consider if you play the card that you draw or if you ink the card that you draw so that if you do draw it be prepared later in the game you can actually play it we do see the Madame Medusa challenge to banish the Robin Hood which Robert should be able to draw a card off of that and we see Queen's Castle ah. come down and Jeremy's going to move both of his characters to the Queen's Castle so that if those characters are still at the Queen's Castle at the start of his next turn he gets to draw an extra two cards yeah and as we've seen in other matches that Queen's Castle can win games so I'm sure that Robert is thinking, 
how am I going to take care of this Queen's Castle? What do you think he's looking for? Yeah, I mean, this would be huge if the Queen's Castle stays and Jeremy's able to draw a couple extra cards. Right now, Robert only has, I believe, five strength on board with the Queen's Castle only having or having seven willpower. So Robert needs to find something to banish the Queen's Castle. I don't think there's any rush characters in Emerald or Steel that could rush into this Queen's Castle. You'd be looking for something like an Along Came Zeus. You'd be looking for something like a Baboom would even do it if you challenge with all of your characters into the Queen's Castle this turn. Uh, there's also there's Rise of the Titans and Avalanche cards that can banish locations just outright. We don't typically see those cards being played in Emerald Steel. So even though Robert has a handful of cards right now, the likelihood that he has an answer is actually pretty low. Yeah, he has a Robin Hood, Hidden Cove. I think I saw Prince John in there. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure that he has anything right now that would take care of that Queen's Castle very quickly. And if we can't take care of the Queen's Castle, we might as well banish one of the characters that are there. The Madame Medusa yeah. is exerted with three damage on her, which means that the Ursula Deceiver, I think, is the most likely thing to challenge into the Medusa and have it banished unless Robert wants to uh, challenge with a Bucky and then play another Bucky if he has one. But at least you can get the Madame Medusa off there so that Jeremy will only draw one card for the next turn for the fox that is at that location. Mm -hmm. And with that Hidden Cove coming out, he is giving all of his characters a boost there. He did pay three ink to move all three characters to the Hidden Cove, and they're all three going into the Queen's Castle. Yeah, I, didn't, I completely missed the Hidden Cove line of being able to play Hidden Cove giving all of your characters extra strength so that now you do have seven willpower to challenge into the Queen's Castle. This is how strong we talked in the last match, I believe, of how strong Hidden Cove can be because of these surprise plays where your opponent thinks, okay, they don't have enough strength on board to challenge into this. And then you say, actually, actually. I do, <laughs> <laughs> after playing the Hidden Cove. So a great representation there of that. Making sure that Jeremy doesn't draw any extra cards for the turn uh, and having a possibility of coming back into this game. Yes. And ah, we see him taking care of not the Hidden Cove. He was thinking about it. He was going to go into Hidden Cove, but instead chose to give Madame Medusa a boost with the Merlin Crab and take out the Beast. Yeah, very uh, thematic for Merlin cards. Whenever Merlin Crab enters and leaves play, you can give one of your characters Challenger plus three. So it's exactly what he did with Madame Medusa so that Madame Medusa had just enough strength, well, a little bit more strength than necessary. <laughs> she was a little under strength for the, for the beast, so need a little help there. We have Jeremy's now at five lore, and Robert is at nine. And we see Ooh. that Flynn coming down. Ooh, that's going to be, that's big. Yeah, this is really big. Right now, Jeremy only has the card that he draws for turn in hand, and Flynn Rider, of course, has four lore, loses a lore for every card uh, that is in Jeremy's hand. So while Jeremy has no cards in hand, Flynn Rider's going to quest for four. Mm -hmm. We see Jeremy drew a Maui, immediately plays the Maui and banishes the Hidden Cove. And now Flynn Rider can quest for four on this next turn. So in Robert's hand, he has a Prince John, and I didn't see what the other card is that he has in hand. Is that another? It's another shiny card, an enchanted something. Hard to see as well. Maybe Ursula? Yes. yes, Ursula and a Prince John. Oh, and they're both coming down. Robert's going all out right now, playing his cards out of his hand, knowing that he's uh, getting pretty close to 20 lore when you consider all of the lore that is on the side of his board right now, jumping all the way up to 15. Jeremy yeah. doesn't have the ability to play something like Be Prepared next turn because he only has six, six ink. ink. So yes. Robert knows he can fairly safely play all of these characters out. It's going to force Jeremy to have an answer for all of them uh, if he wants to stay in this game. He does have a friend on the other side in hand, so he could sing that um, and with one of his characters. He needs an inkable card and a be prepared. Let's see if he finds it. We find the be prepared. Oh, is that he an did. inkable card? It is Maleficent. Oh my goodness! And he's gonna he's gonna quest, quest with the uh, with the crab. Maleficent, and we see be prepared. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> he he finds the out of exactly inkable card and be prepared. Uh, managed to find it, banishing Robert's entire board, including his own. And now, I mean, he can potentially come back if he continues to find answers to these uh, cards that Robert's playing. Robert, of course, still had a pretty healthy hand, so he's going to come back immediately, play a couple characters. Uh, so it's going to be a it's going to be a climb if Jeremy wants to come back, but that's exactly what he needed. It is, uh, yeah. He he needed it probably sooner than he found it, but. 
it did help him live to see another turn. And the Chernobox followers was <laughs> not the card that you wanted to see at this point in the game. No, not the card you want to see at all. It'll help Jeremy dig uh, a little deeper, except it's going to get removed by a Strength of a Raging Fire. So Jeremy needs, like, another beef prepared, I think, and doesn't find doesn't it. Doesn't find it. The win goes to Robert. So Emerald Steel, really, those Buckies and everything, Diablo. So this, yeah, this matchup is does seem like it kind of tips in favor to Emerald Steel, especially if they can get those Diablos and Buckies. Even without Bucky, though, I feel like Emerald Steel is really favored in this matchup. It's kind of tough because the Ruby Amethyst player essentially has to play cards that draw cards for the first six or seven turns of the game just because of how threatening a card like Bucky is. Even if your opponent has Diablo, you need a couple pieces, right? If they play yeah. the Floodborne Diablo, you really need a Brawl to get rid of that Diablo because you are trying to play cards that draw you cards throughout the game. And if you're drawing cards for five or six turns and your opponent is also drawing all of those cards, mm -hmm. you're not really gaining much of an advantage. You're still staying in the game and that you have enough cards to ink and play per turn. But there's definitely a lot of answers that Ruby Amethyst needs in this matchup, whereas Emerald Steel has some pretty safe answers for what Ruby Amethyst tries to do anyway. If we see Jeremy open with like a Chernabog and a Flynn, it should, unfortunately looks like he doesn't have the one drop. You know, you have all the steel removal that you can use to banish the Flynn if you want to, or you have characters that can contest them in strength for the first turn or two. But Robert does have the Diablo and the Bucky we see on turns one and two. Fortunately for Jeremy, Robert does not have the shift Diablo to follow that up. So it's just going to be this Bucky on turn two. So what's interesting is I think... I think that Jeremy actually did have a Chernobog's followers in his hand. Oh, okay. I, I'm maybe I missed missed it. I know I saw be prepared in there, a brawl. Um, but would there be a reason why you wouldn't play that I, on turn one? I think there is, and the reason for this is because Robert is on the play. Robert went first this turn. See, there it is. Which means yeah, that. He's inking it. Robert can play a, a small Diablo on turn one. Jeremy saw this, and so Jeremy says, okay, if I play a Trinobox Followers, and then Robert can shift Diablo next turn, then Robert can also sing a removal song on my Trinobox Followers, keeping me from drawing a card. So rather than playing a card and then it going to the discard pile, you want to keep as many cards in your hand as possible so that you can make it to that six or seven ink. So instead of playing the Trinobox Followers, Jeremy says, this is actually better used as a card that goes into my inkwell. Interesting. In case Robert does have that line of being able to sing a removal action card on the Chernabog. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense that, you know, it's like we've talked about before, resources are mm -hmm. really important. <laughs> and especially with Chernabog's followers, that's, that's a card that you want to make sure sticks on the board because um, you can choose to banish it to draw a card. And so it's not just about having a body on the board. It's that card draw element, too. Yeah, it would be totally different if Jeremy was going first because then he can quest and banish the Chernabog before, before. Robert has the ability to banish it mm -hmm. himself. So that's, I mean, that's the kind of differences and things you have to think about uh, when playing Disney Lorcana at a highly competitive state like this, knowing when you're on the play, on the draw, how to play around those. But we do see Robert play in Ursula, Deceiver of All, very powerful card, being able to sing songs twice and then put that song on the bottom of your deck. Specifically, really good for either any sudden chills that Robert might be playing to force Jeremy to discard two cards for the turn instead of just one, mm -hmm. or the plethora of damage steal actions that Robert has available to him as well. So many. Um, did you know that Ursula, you know Ursula's an octopus, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but did you know that she only has six tentacles? No, I did not. Even in the movie and in the art on Lorcana cards as well, she has six tentacles. I would never noticed that. I but never counted. If you count her arms, though, she has eight limbs. Okay. So there you that, go. I guess that makes sense. <laughs> she, there's still eight. So that's yes. up to eight. We do see Jeremy playing a brawl on the Ursa Deceiver of all. Uh, recognizing how powerful it could be for uh, yes. Robert to sing any songs with her and saying, it's not a Diablo, but it's still strong enough to warrant removal. So, yes. Now, some decks I know are, are made where you don't put a lot on the board in the first few turns. I don't think Ruby Amethyst is typically 
that kind of deck, but that's kind of what we're seeing happen here. I think not typically. It depends on the matchup, and I think specifically okay. going into Emerald Steel, you mentioned resources earlier and how important it is in a card game, and specifically in this matchup, you know that Emerald Steel is attacking your resources in your hand specifically, and when you're, also, when you're attacking resources in hand, you're also maybe even without realizing it, attacking your opponent's ink because the less mm -hmm. cards you have in hand, the less cards you can ink, and uh, you're attacking the cards that your opponent has to play. So Jeremy, knowing that Emerald Steel typically doesn't have a lot of high questing characters earlier in the game, so it's a bit okay to give up a little bit of lore that Robert can gain in these first two or three turns, knowing that I'm going to keep extra cards in my hand and guarantee that I have cards to ink every turn and that I can at least get up to seven ink so that hopefully I can find to be prepared and answer this board before Robert gets too far ahead. Yes. Well, squeaky, squeak, squeak em. <laughs> We have two Buckies on the board here. Two Buckies on board. <laughs> Robert also did something really interesting uh, the last turn in that he played a one-drop Robin Hood and then shifted the Robin Hood on top of it because Robert's only playing with four ink right now. Yeah. Hasn't inked up to five. So just to get the one bis uh, Bucky discard trigger off. So now we have two. Every Floodborne character that Robert plays is going to force Jeremy to discard two cards. I'm sure Jeremy is trying his hardest to keep these cards in his hand. And this is why it's important for him to not play characters mm -hmm. early in the game because if he played a card every turn after this, you know, he'd be two or three cards less in his hand than he has currently. Yeah, and like you've said before, in the Ruby Amethyst deck, a lot of the tools and answers that you're going to have are at the five, six, and seven ink. And so making sure that he has cards in hand that he can put into his ink well are just going to be really important. Um, what do you think that Jeremy is thinking now, though, that he is up to five ink? Do you think he's feeling a little bit more comfortable? Definitely more comfortable, uh, specifically because of the size of his hand. I'm not sure how many uninkables are in his hand. I think I've spotted quite a few, so I don't know how difficult mm -hmm. his inking situation is currently. But even just being at six ink and having multiple cards in your hand like this, you know you can pretty safely make it to seven. And once you make it to seven, that's where Ruby Amethyst can really come back from this game. The most impactful cards the Ruby Amethyst has a lot of times is to play those expensive Ruby characters like Madame Medusa, even Maui, or Be Prepared as well. So as soon as you can secure enough ink to play those, then if you draw it off the top, it's okay because you already have the ink to play it. And those are cards that really help you come back in these scenarios because we see Robert has built a really wide board, two Diablos, yes. two Buckies, a Robin Hood as well. And so he's not questing for a ton. The Robin Hood is questing for two, but because he has so many characters on board, they all add up together, you know, questing for five or six Lord yeah, turn at this point. Turn. Yeah. So it's critical that he has something like I keep mentioning, be prepared because that's really the answer here so that you can basically start over, wipe Robert's board completely and start slowly gaining advantage over time and coming back. Yeah. We did see that Madame Medusa in his hand, and I was wondering if that's what we're going to see, is um, Madame Medusa coming down, choosing to banish that Robin Hood, because that's really was that biggest quester on the board there. Biggest quester, and one of the biggest threats in that Robin Hood can challenge your other characters mm -hmm. and still gain lore. You know, it's super important for Emerald Steel to get as much lore as possible early in the game, because playing against a deck with a better late game like Ruby Amethyst you're less likely to have your character stay on board at least long enough to quest with. And something else to think about, Robert has a wide board, but two of those cards are Bucky. Robert doesn't really want to exert these Buckies if he doesn't have to. He wants to only exert them when he knows they'll be safe, which yeah. is basically never at this point. Oh, yeah, and he's seen Jeremy's hand because of the Di Diablo that he played, so he knows Be Prepared is there. Um, but he's choosing not to quest with Bucky. Do you think that... There's a reason, like, why would he not choose to quest now if he knows that Be Prepared is going to take them out? Uh, that's a good question, to be honest with you. Okay. If he knows that Be Prepared is coming along, it may be advantageous to just go ahead and quest with him. The other reason might just be to force the Be Prepared. Mm -hmm. So Ruby Amethyst has cards like the Peter Pan Shadowfinder, the Maui, these cards that have Rush, and Robert only had the two Buckies and the Diablos in play, so if you quest with all of them, well, he had a Madame Medusa in play, all he needs is another Maui or a 
Peter Pan Shadow Finder, which he did draw off the top, then you can play that mm -hmm. to banish the exerted characters, and now you don't have to play the Be Prepared. You, you can get rid it. of them anyway and mm -hmm. save it. So it sort of <laughs> forces Jeremy to play this Be Prepared, and that's one less Be Prepared that he'll have later. Yeah. I have to be honest. This is one of my favorite things to do as a player myself is to play Be Prepared. Your opponent puts down another character, and then you come right back and say, well, Lady Tremaine. Sorry. <laughs> Should have played another character. Oh, Lady Tremaine is great, and I'm, I'm glad to see that some players are still including her index because um, she she's a lot of fun. I know we've talked before um, in some other mad matches, Madame Medusa, you know, is really strong, but Lady Tremaine, I think, still has has a nice place in the deck. Absolutely. These these ladies in chairs, as the mm -hmm. community likes to call them, are very strong for different reasons. Lady Tremaine forces your opponent to pick a character to banish when she's played. And so, of course, when there's only one character in play, that's the only character they can banish. And she was an extremely strong card in set two, sort of tapered off when Madame Medusa got introduced in set three and has seen more of a comeback because people have stopped playing around her. I remember in Rise of the Floodborne, every deck was playing small oh, one-drop yes. characters. So you had something <laughs> to play next to that threat uh, in case your opponent had a Lady Tremaine. And just, people just aren't doing that anymore, so you can get away uh, with plays like that, where they just play a Tragic Beast and then the Lady Tremaine comes down. Yeah. Um, but there's really been, since Jeremy was able to play that Be Prepared, a dramatic shift here in the board state. Um, how do you think, um, what do you think Robert's going through Robert's mind here in, in the current game state? So Robert's trying his hardest to utilize um, threatening cards like Diablo. We see him playing the Diablos, hoping that he can get the Diablos exerted playing the Robin Hood Champion of Sherwood so that you can start to challenge your opponent's characters and continue to gain a little lore. Unfortunately, Jeremy is doing what Ruby is best at doing and just keeps banishing these cards. This is why it was so important for Emerald Steel to gain as much lore as possible at the beginning of the game because as the game goes later and later, Ruby Amethyst just has more options to banish your characters before they're really able to quest and before they're able to do anything while continuing to build a wide board themselves. And Ruby Amethyst starts to really pop off here, being able to play their Merlin Rabbits, bounce them back. All those cards you discarded earlier, you're starting to draw a bunch of extra cards. And unless Robert can, unless Robert can stick a Diablo or something that can draw him cards as well, he's going to be working with very limited resources. Mm. And there was another Be Prepared in Dermy's hand, but Robert was able to force the discard there with the Ursula Deceiver. It's definitely a start because you don't want Jeremy to have access to another Be Prepared in yeah. case you do start to come back and are able to build another wide board, so that's great. Jeremy's hand is still looking very great, though, having two Merlin Rabbits in hand, also having a Flynn, Sisu, and a Maui. Yes. The Sisu is a little bit uh, less threatening because Robert's not working with a ton of cards, but the Maui having six strength is certainly enough to make sure that the Flynn gets a trigger every turn and Robert just not having very many cards in his hand. Robert's out. He's yeah. empty-handed. No cards in his hand means that uh, it's more likely for the Flynn Rider to be able to trigger gaining through lore at the start of Jeremy's turn. We do see a fun card that we haven't yeah. seen in a little while, though. Donald Duck coming he down. He just celebrated a birthday. He did just Nine celebrate a birthday. birthday. He's, he's an old duck. <laughs> he is. <laughs> but, uh, he's a classic. He has, yes. a, he has a very fun ability. Uh, it's it's a group hug ability. Everybody gets to draw cards at the start of Robert's turn. Uh, Jeremy can decide if he wants to draw another card, and Robert... Uh, gets to draw an extra card off of Donald Duck as well. It's sort of like a pseudo tragic beast. I see people playing him for that reason. Oh, yeah, yeah. He also has to uh, lore and a lot of willpower, so he can be difficult to banish through challenging and can also quest for a fair amount. And because your opponent gets to draw cards off of him, you're kind of incentivized not to challenge him. In this case, I expect fully Jeremy to banish uh, the Donald Duck if he can because... Robert's already at 14 lore. But. Yeah, I think, Robert, yeah, he's counting up the lore <laughs> on board there and going, well, Jeremy gets this one because he put down three characters 